live. Amen. We're going to go ahead and, and begin uh, today's session of uh, our Bible study, our noonday Bible study. We're going to trust and believe that God has something in store for us. Amen. Praise God. And we are going to hope and pray that as we... Uh, uh, um, as we come together, as we discuss the things of God, as we deal with uh, the issues of faith and the issues uh, regarding our spirituality and in our, in our discipleship, that God would fill us not only with uh, the knowledge, but he will fill us with the compassion and love necessary to, to temper that knowledge and allow us to uh, bless those who he brings us in contact with today, tomorrow, and the days to come. Amen. So let's do this. Let's go ahead. I'm going to I'm going to give an opening prayer. Then we'll move into our um, our uh, question and answer session. Amen. Praise God. And then after that, if we if we have dealt with all the questions or there are no questions, we'll go into our lesson. We'll pick up with our lesson where we last left off, all right? So here, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, Father God, it is time once again for your children to assemble in fellowship, warning and needing to hear from you, to receive a word from you, so that God, not only will we will our service be effective, efficient, and efficacious, but our faith walls will be sustained and empowered. That God, no matter where we are, there's always room to grow. There's always room to add more. There's always room for us to experience more of your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And so, God, we pray that you would not withhold it from us, that, God, you would shower us with it, that you would provide us with what we need, so that, God, we may be exactly who you've called us to be to the world. Now, Father God, thank you for Brother Sean and Sister uh, Carol and whoever else is joining us today for Bible study, and we pray, God, a special blessing upon them for their sacrifice of time. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Uh, bro Brother Sean, I understand that last week you had a, a service technician come to the house, so you had to go deal with the service technician. I wanted to give you a chance in case there were any questions that you had on your heart, your mind, and your spirit, but we're, we're unable to ask them because you had to go meet the service technician at the door. Praise the Lord. Pastor Al, I pray so much. Thank you for remembering. Yes, sir. You know, I'm impressed. Anyway, no, <laughs> no, there's no question I had, sir, but thanks. Thanks for asking. <laughs> hey, 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 amen. Praise God. Hey, 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 I keep telling you, I know it's hard to believe, but you do mean a lot to me. Amen. And so, and, and so I, I tend to make sure that my people are good. Amen. Amen. So, so, so I, I, I know, I know, I know it may not be the same kind of love your mama gave you, but it's, it's love nevertheless. <laughs> amen. Praise God. Praise God. And so, all right. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Sister Sister Carol. Amen. Please. Amen. Praise God. And I'm ready to. I've been doing my spiritual calisthenics. I've been doing my spiritual jumping jacks in my in my if I'm running in place so I can be ready for you today. on television uh -huh. that I really respect. Okay. And, um, you know, it was the old, this is on YouTube, it was older. Okay. But she was talking about the election with Hillary Clinton and uh, mm -hmm. Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So the thing was, she was talking initially about women, you know, teaching and preaching mm -hmm. and this and this and that over men. Right. So that was primary focus. And then he talked about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and to say he has a hard decision to make because if the woman cannot um, be over men, teaching men in the church, 
how could a female be over uh, men in the country? How could she lead the country? So in a way, you can see that he was going to go for Donald Trump. Right. Because he said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get in the polling thing, but whoever I, whenever I vote for him, it will be the right decision. So I was just wondering about that. Um, is that so? The only thing that we know when the woman really ruled over um, a country was Deborah in the Old Testament. And we know that with the Golder Meir rode over Israel in recent history. And now we've got a lot of females that are leaders of their country. But what do you think about that? Uh, in fact, that's a great question. And so let me, let me. No, I want to know the answer. <laughs> a, a, amen, amen. So let let me answer it like this. I think that that pastor, and any pastor or any religious leader, that believes that a woman cannot lead a house of worship or serve in any leadership position that requires her to be over a man is not only antiquated, but they are sexist, they are discriminatory, and they they have completely missed the whole what everything God is trying to do. They they've completely missed it. Uh uh and um it personally offends me when I run into leaders, especially Christian leaders, ministers, that still hold on to this belief that women cannot serve as leaders over everyone. Not just not just women over women, women over men and children. All right, and I I remember when I was interviewing with this one church in Canton, Ohio. Uh, they, 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 the some of the men on the council on their on their search committee had an issue because in my answer to their uh, um, inquiry when I applied, they want to know how I felt about women serving in ministry, and my answer to them was this: When you're born, who is it that breastfeeds you? And so, of course, they said. My our mothers, and then they got then they tried to come come from the follow that up with well it's only women that can breastfeed men, breastfeed babies, and I and I asked him I said well have you ever thought why that is, have you ever thought why God re relegated that to just women and not us men, in fact try in fact let's let's not get hung up on that. In the middle of the night when you cried out for help, who was it that came down the hall more times than not? They're like, our mothers. When you stumped your toe, who was it that put the band-aid on it? Mama. When you uh, got your heart broke by some little rooted to the nappy headed girl, who was the one that talked to you about it? And they're like, more than likely it was mama. And, and I said, so in every stage of development, who can, I said, who came down to school when you needed someone to advocate for you? They're like, mama, because daddy was at, at work. I said, so in every, pr pretty much every aspect of uh, your life, formative years, you, it was your mama that God called upon to lead you and bless you. They're like, yes. All right. So help me out. Uh, how many men here went to school where... Every teacher that you had was a male, so no one raised a hand. I said, well, what about every teacher 80% of the time was a male? No one raised a hand. Sissy, no one. When I said 10%, they finally put up their hands. I said, so for 90% of the time, God has entrusted your training, your education to a woman. And they're like, yes. I said, when you go, I said, how many of us have been in the hospital? We all raise hands. I said, how many male nurses have you run into? No one raised their hand, okay? I said, how many uh, male doctors you raised your hand? So they raised. I said, well, how many of you also had female doctors? They kept their hands up. I said, was the treatment any different between uh, your, your male doctor and your female doctor? They're like, no. I said, oh, okay. 
All right. I, I said, well, I look around here in this room. Uh, I see that you've got women on your pastoral search committee. Or oh, do they have a vote? And so the women looked at the men and they're like, yeah, they got a vote. I said, does their vote weigh the same as yours? Yes, everyone gets one vote. Really? So isn't that essentially, because I looked around the room, I said, there's more women on this committee than there are men. So isn't essentially allowing the women to have the same level power of vote that you have, essentially putting them as female leaders over men that they could choose the leader that they really want to choose? And it doesn't have to be a man. And they all look at each other like, oh, my God, I did not think of that. I said, so here's the thing. Here's, I, and, and so one, one of the guys, the guy, he said, all right, Pastor, what, what, what's the point you're making? I said, the point I'm making is, is how asinine you look and sound right now, trying to push for this idea that women cannot serve in leadership positions in the church or, or overall. I, I told them, I said, the problem is... Like always, we quote scripture without understanding it. When Paul says, I do not allow a woman to uh, lead over a man, he was saying that in a, within a context, a societal context. Christianity was considered the pagan religion at the time. It was the one that was heretical. The whole idea that people worship one God and one God alone, that enough was to make people look at Christian Christianity suspicious. Then they didn't understand this whole thing about Holy Communion because they're like, what kind of religion is this that people eat the body of their God and drink their drink his blood? That's not a religion, that's a cult. And so what happened, Christians were being persecuted because of the ignorance of, of main, mainstream Romans and the Roman Empire. And so what Paul was constantly doing, he was constantly instructing these Christians in these small house churches to not do anything that caused them to come under undue scrutiny. All right? No other religion at the time allowed women to lead. So that's what Paul does, being a, an apologist. Paul says, I'm not going to allow it either, because if it, if it, if it occurs that uh, persons, if it occurs to persons that, the, that we Christians are being led by women, then in the Roman Empire, then that's going to bring undue attention, we'll be arrested, we'll be persecuted. Now, here's a funny thing. Two chapters later, from when he says that in Romans, all right, he turns around and acknowledges a set of female apostles. These ain't female ministers, female deacons, female trustees. These are female apostles. These are women that have been elevated to the level of apostle since the institution of the church. And he acknowledges that they are co-laborers with him. Okay? Here's another thing. He also turns around and acknowledges that much of his ability to engage in ministry is a result of the assistance of women. Not men. Not men. When you look back at Jesus' ministry, nine times out of ten, it is not them twelve rusty, dusty knuckleheads that Jesus, that Jesus could rely on. It was women. Shoot, when it came time to, to prepare his body for burial, the men were too scared to even come out the house. It was women who risked everything to go to his tomb to prepare his body. Don't you know that Pontius Pilate and the Roman, Romans and the Sanhedrin Council had people on watch because they were looking to arrest anyone who was following Jesus? So these women, these, uh, these, I'm sorry, not these women, these women risked everything to uh to go bear to go perform what society required what israelite society required and here's the thing god decided to make the very first christian minister be what a woman mary madeline is the first christian minister right it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because some gospels she doesn't see him. She sees the two angels. It doesn't matter which gospel we're looking at. The fact is, 
she is the first evangelist, the first Christian minister, because she's the first one to give the, the testimony that Jesus rose. Okay? And it, it's, it's so, here's the thing. Look at Deborah. Go, since you mentioned her, look at, look at, look at why she becomes, and she becomes a judge before a whole lot of other folks do. Reason why? Because a man of, of the hour was too scared to stand up against the enemies of Israel. And what did she say? She she told the the, the that 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 male leader that today God is going to give victory not to you but to a woman. When God when God announces His intention to change how uh, He was issuing salvation to humanity, He didn't announce it to Joseph. He went to Mary. He went to the woman first. When, 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 here, 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 here's, here's the thing. Uh, you don't think Zachariah wanted a child as much as Elizabeth did, did you? You didn't think that, uh, 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 what's his name? Pen, uh, uh, Elkanah wanted a child as much as Hannah did. God spoke to the wives first, to the women first, not to the husbands. In fact, the husbands, then you have a clue what was going on. Yeah. And, and here's the funny thing. In Zachariah's case, when he finally, when he finally was told of all, by all, of all angels, the angel of death, and I keep getting, trying to get people to understand how significant this is. The one who was re whose sole responsibility was simply to implement death is the one that announces life. And what does Zachariah do? He, he, yeah, the, Gabriel is an angel of death. That's his, that his job is is to go around implementing death. That that's the angel that God sent whenever He wanted to to destroy and kill people. Gabriel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But yet when it's come to make the announcement that, that God was a standing life, he sent Gabriel. And Zechariah laughed. And what was the punishment? He couldn't speak until uh John was born. He, he, here's the thing. Uh you remember the woman at the well? Uh had the five husbands and the sixth man she was sleeping with wasn't her husband. Christian evangelist, she's the one that goes to a Gentile nation, a Gentile city, and witnesses about Jesus, that brings Gentiles to Jesus, who, be, who end up converting to what is now Christianity, it would have been, it would have been Judaism, but converting and believing in him themselves, her. You know, uh, Jesus doesn't heal uh, Peter's father-in-law. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. Again, the, 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 this whole idea that women are somehow not allowed or permitted, that is a, an antiquated and out of custom, out of time, uh, uh, um, concession that just like the scripture was used to justify slavery, this has been used to keep women from out of ministry. And let me go ahead and say this because I know that I know of a whole denomination right now. Amen. In fact, they all do. So let me not just make it one. Uh, because guess what? I come from a Baptist denomination, and, and right here in this state, right here, if you go anywhere east of Union County, uh, you're going to have a fight to ordain a woman into ministry or to, or to hire a, woman, a female pastor. You just are. And so I was getting ready to mention uh, my cogent brothers and sisters, brothers, brothers, uh, but they ain't the only one. They are not the only one. 
uh, there are many churches and denominations that, that, that frown upon women serving in leadership. And I think that's anti antiquated. And I think that is actually not love, that's hate. And the very persons that subscribe to this belief are going to find themselves sitting on the outside of the gates of heaven. And they're going to be like, Lord, Lord, why didn't, why, why didn't you let me in? He's going to look at them and say, get away from me. I never knew you. There's, go ahead. You, yes, yes, yes. You can ask me anything. You mean Adam? That's the, it, it, and, and, and Sister Carol, let me let me say. So let me repeat that because you you kind of faded out a little bit. Sister Carol said this is for people online and for people online on Facebook and watching this YouTube. She said. She's heard that a lot of people have said that one of the reasons why women should not be allowed in leadership is because when we go back to Genesis, it's the woman that was deceived, not the man. Uh, let, let me go ahead and destroy that argument because I know it's not your argument. You're just merely saying it. All right. That's a bunch of horse malarkey. OK, that's a bunch of horse boo boo. OK, because if we read the scripture in fact we walk through this we walk through it adam is sitting right there beside eve when the snake when the serpent started talking at no time did mr man mr righteous mr leader step up and be a leader and say you know what nah baby hold up our god told us not to eat from this tree it doesn't matter how curious we are. It doesn't matter what it may do or what it may not do. It doesn't matter how it may protect us or not protect us. The, the, the bottom line is we were given an instruction and it's our duty to follow it. He said nothing. He sat there. Listen to what the, what the serpent said. Watch him give, the serpent give Eve the, uh, the piece of fruit and watch her eat it and did not say anything. You want to know why? Because he wanted to eat it too. And that is, that is scapegoating. That is scapegoating her. Because the truth is, he had every, even if she was deceived, and she wasn't, or, or she wasn't deceived alone, even if she was, he had every right, all the power, every chance to stop it. He said nothing because the word says she bit in it and then she turned and gave him a bite, which means he's sitting right beside her. That is scapegoating. That's the same thing that white people have used for years to try to justify slavery by saying that we are the descendants of Ham and, and Noah cursed us to be slaves because uh, of what happens in Genesis. Wait a second. Wait a second. It is believed that that occurred before the flood. No, 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 I'm sorry. It occurs after, it occurs after the flood. It occurs after the flood. I'm sorry. It occurs after the flood. Okay? But wait a second. God doesn't condemn a race of people he condemns the descendants of Ham not every one of us and here's the thing Ham wasn't the only brown one in Noah's family they all were brown so let's, let's stop that foolishness as if Ham is the only like, like you know how you have a dog that has puppies and one dog is comes out with black fur and all the other ones have white fur let's stop acting like that is how it happens with, with human beings all right it happens with dolls like that because there are multiple eggs being uh, in, 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 uh, fertilized when a dog mate, when two dogs mate. And if you have a dog that has not had a pure 
line of white coat furs, it's possible that you're going to birth a dog, a puppy with a different color fur, okay? But that's not what happens with, with, with human beings, okay? If, if you know, it, it, I, I, in fact, like, like I told, not like I told, like, like, like the comedian Cat Williams said about uh, Michael Jackson's children. He said, when's the last time you seen a white person and a black person have sex and their children come out with blonde hair, blue eyes, and no indication of ethnicity at all? It doesn't happen. That's because being black is to have a d dominant gene. To be white is to have a recessive gene. The dominant gene always overpowers the recessive gene. So don't sit here and try to make the argument that Noah had a bunch of white babies or non-black babies and had one, him. They all were black. Or all dark-skinned. And so trying to use him as an excuse to say that all black people, that, that was... Uh, it was theological trickery. In fact, that was theological theological calisthenics to even justify that. And the same thing is happening when we see men jump up and say, because she was deceived, she can't be trusted. That's foolishness. If, and, if, and here's the thing. If she was deceived and can't be trusted with leadership, then what do we say about men? It's one thing to be deceived. It's another thing to know it and do it. That means Adam had no intention of serving God. And if we're going to attribute to all women something from Eve, then let's attribute to all men that we men shouldn't be in leadership either. Because when it comes time to choose between God and whatever else, we're going to choose whatever else every time. That's a bunch of, oh God, y'all about to make me cuss today. That's a bunch of horse stuff. That's a bunch of horse stuff. And, and, it, and it, it ruffles my feathers to no degree. Because typically the main ones making this argument, the main ones that want to see it implemented are the very ones that have no right to have it implemented to begin with. Black folks have no right to be engaging in any type of discrimination. I don't care what the word says. For a people that have been discriminated for hundreds of years, if not thousands, you ain't got no right to be sitting here discriminating against anyone. Whether they gay, whether they women, what no no, you don't have not nary a right. Nary a right. Because the truth is, current events are showing us we are still fighting discrimination. And how are we going to ever expect God to bless us in terms of the discrimination we encounter if we are so busy discriminating against others? The devil is a liar. And there ain't no truth in them. No. So no, that, that's foolishness. And I have no problem saying it to anyone. This is probably why a lot of preachers don't want to fool with me. Because again, I'm not going to... I don't believe in sitting here. I, I don't believe in sitting quiet in the, in the midst of a bunch of foolishness. Yeah, okay. he, he, you know, I, I remember I, I, I knew I lost at one church because in the middle of their interviewing me they said it's your anniversary you and your wife go out to celebrate anniversary and they bring you a a bottle of wine are you going to drink it i was like yes it's my anniversary and so they started going on with you know you do i said show me in the scripture where it says do not drink alcohol and of course i knew where they were going they were going right there to where paul says do not drink anything in excess and i had to show that i said that doesn't say do not drink alcohol that says do not do anything in excess in other words do not get drunk drunkenness is drinking to assess just like uh uh eating and eating and eating till you become overweight that's eating to assess you can even exercise to assess it is about 
doing any everything in moderation, not a prohibition against drinking. Why would he? Why would Paul issue that? There was only three drinks for them to drink at the time. Were well, four: water, milk, juice, wine. And let's be for real. Most of the time, they could not preserve the fruit, the fruit juice too often, and the fruit juice became what wine. So why would Paul remotely tell people not to drink one of the few drinks that they had to drink around there? What he's saying is don't get drunk because in your drunkenness, you engage in behaviors that, that brings uh, condemnation upon you. It damages and destroys your witness. But he doesn't say, he, he never said don't drink. I mean, in fact, Jesus even says that to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He says, I think you think I'm a drunk because I'm sitting around with other drunk drunkards drinking wine with them. And guess what he says? It's not the righteous that need a doctor, but the sick. I didn't come to save the righteous. I came to save the sinner. So all these arguments designed to keep women out of leadership positions are merely self-righteousness rearing its ugly head trying to oppose its righteousness over and above of that of God's righteousness. And it's important that you, me, and whoever else stop that foolishness from continuing to happen. Time out with with, with with remaining silent. It's time to speak up. You know better. It's time to speak up and say, no, nah, that's not how, what God is, is aiming for. That's not what God is shooting for. That's not the word of God. And guess what? You don't have to be a theologian. You ain't got to be a pastor. You ain't got to be a seminary professor to do it. Just who you are in your own stand is enough to say, that's not right. That's not how, 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 how what God is, is shooting for or aiming for. That's not right at all. And we have to be bold enough to say it. Yeah, it's going to mean some people don't want to be around you. But guess what? They didn't want to be around you to begin with. They only, they, they only quote unquote, tolerated you because there was something your presence gave them. And even if you didn't give them something tangible, your presence gave them something. Because they used your presence as complicit agreement with whatever they were saying. So guess what? Sometimes it's not simply saying what needs to be said. Sometimes it's getting up and leaving. It's walking out. It's not letting someone use your present as complicit agreement with whatever foolishness they're saying. It's going on, yeah. Again, the word says try the spirit by the spirit. Study to show yourself approved, not of man, but of God. And by study to show yourself approved, willingness to stand the word. One of the things that made Jesus such a danger is his willingness to point out when the other spiritual leaders or religious leaders had gotten God's word wrong. In fact, remember when the whole thing where Jesus says, talks about when you tell your parents that whatever help you gave them is I forgot what their term was but basically that evens it up that you don't you have no more obligation to them he says you're perverting the word he said the the word is honor your mother and your father so that your date your days upon the earth will be long that's that's the word this whole thing coming up with whatever help I've given you it evens it up he said, he said, that that's you making up stuff. That ain't the word of God. Now imagine folks sitting around who were trying to get out the obligation of assisting their mother and father. All, all of a sudden, Jesus said, no, you're not released from the obligation. You still got to help them. Here's another one. Why do you let them eat without washing their hands? You know that's against the law. Jesus said, no, that ain't against the law. God never specified any requirement to wash your hand. You did. And technically, it's not a bad requirement because we know how many germs are on the hands. But God never sat there and said, if you eat with unclean hands, that, that, that you are going to hell. 
on wash hands. Man made that up. And so what we have to do is be like God. Be like, no, 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 no. That, that ain't the law. That ain't what the word says. That ain't, that ain't what God requires. The problem is many of us ain't bold enough to speak up. Because we don't want to be the one ostracized. And I, and, uh, and again, we already know he or she that stands for God is probably going to be standing alone. There's a whole lot of people that say they love God, but their actions say otherwise. Their actions say otherwise. This is why Jesus said, those people that call on me, Lord, Lord, you're going to look at this like, get away from me. I never knew you. There's a requirement that God imposes. Amen. There's a requirement he imposes that those of us that are going to be called by his name would live our lives submitted to him. And we've been talking about that at Disciples Academy. That's the ugly S word. Just like for women, the, the B word is an ugly B word. And for black folks, the N word is an ugly N word. For Christians, the, uh, the ugly word is submission. Because it's, it's, it's cause again, it, it, it's not submission on a surface level. It's total submission. Because again, we don't have a problem being submitted when we know our submission is getting ready to bless us. So here's God sitting there on the corner handing out blessing. And all you have, all you have to do is get in line and be submitted. We don't have a problem submitting then. But no one wants to submit when God is saying it's time to get in line because I'm getting ready to assign each of you a cross to bear. And it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. You're going to, be, you're going to suffer. Oh no, we do. oh no, that, that line had diminished so quickly because the human nature is not to suffer. In fact, you had gotten off the line last week, Brother Sean, to, 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 to deal with the service person. But one of the things I shared with Sister Carol, because I wanted to encourage her, but I also wanted other people that were watching or will watch to understand that the difficulties, the trials and tribulations we experience are not because God wants us to suffer, per se. They're not because God is punishing us. It's because God has decided he can trust us with the weight of this issue. That, they, that there are times, yes, we acknowledge there are times when your bride wishes that she didn't have to carry the cross that she's carrying right now. She would. There are times where, where, when it's just her and God, even when, when you, even when you're not around, that she feels some kind of way about having to go through what she's going through. But here's the thing: God didn't assign it to anyone else because someone else would have died already. Yeah. And not only, it, it wouldn't be just that they died; they would have, they would have done something to die. Because they would, they they wouldn't want to have they wouldn't want to have carried this burden, and I and I share with your wife that persons, amen, when they see your wife are encouraged, and again they may never tell you that, but they're encouraged because what they say is if she can find a reason to worship God and dealing with everything that she's dealing with, what is my excuse? Yes, I. Again, I remember I, the, the last church I was at before pastoring, there was a brother there named Sean. Amen. It's funny. His name was Sean, too. And Sean was, hey. yeah, a, amen. Sean was born with both mental and physical birth defects, all right? That, that when I met Sean, Sean probably was 28, 29 years old, okay? okay. And Sean when Bishop would preach, especially when he was going in, Sean be worshiping in his wheelchair harder than anybody else. He, he, the, only, the only thing he could move was his head, his left arm, and his two fingers on his right hand. Okay? He couldn't even move his right arm. But he would start shaking that head and waving that left hand and, and, and trying to holler as much as he can when that word got good to him. 
and, and, and I commented to some ministers when they, we were all sitting together. I said, you know what? He puts us to the shame. Yeah. I, I said, not that anyone has a right to be mad at God, but if, if, if there are people that need to get in line, he should be at he, he should be one of the ones at the head of the line. And, 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 and I told him, I said, and he, from the time he comes in here to the time he leaves, he goes in on worshiping. He's worshiping God. I said, but yet many of us sitting here, we got to let the worship leader pep us up, get us excited, make us remember everything that God has done for us. Then we, we don't really stay there. We come back down. The choir's got to sing us back up. Then pastors got to preach. Bishops got to preach for an hour, preach hard for an hour to get us to celebrate God. It's almost like God is begging us to worship him. When the truth is that we should be celebrating him before anybody else. And what happens at some point, you and I have to be bold enough to look at our brothers and sisters and ask them, what's wrong? Why are you asking what's wrong? Because you ain't praising God. I'm looking at you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're up against. But you're here. You're cool and in your right mind. I don't again I don't know what you're up against, but I, I do know that there should be some praise coming out of you somehow, some way. It ought to be, yeah. It ought to be, yes, right. Yeah, to be And so that's what we're saying and what I'm expressing, what I mean here. By God is looking for some people that can handle the assignment, handle the weight of the assignment. Amen. Not everyone is called upon to carry the burdens that you and I carry. And, and the danger for us is to get mad and upset and say, well, God, that's not fair. You didn't give that to them. God is looking at us saying they can't handle it. I gave them what they can handle. And, and so if the only thing they can handle is a temporary problem that that is dealt with in five minutes praise god that they handled it and hopefully whoever's at that stage that needs to understand how to handle a temporary problem that can be fixed in five minutes saw it and learned it pray that god would do the same thing with you with the cross you're bearing yes, Lord. amen go so guess what we all bear a cross amen Amen. Amen. My, mine is named Jimmy Rembert. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Uh, you know, I, I got to get a dig in, even in his absence. I got to get a dig in. Amen. Praise God. Um, no, but it, uh, it, it's, it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. But yeah, so again, again, I, I, I hope I've answered your question, Sister Carol. If not, you know, let me know. I'll, I'll answer it again. Amen. I don't know. See if anybody else have a question. Like, you know, I got a part two to that question. Okay. You got a part two? Well, nobody else has a. No, you got. You're good. Don't worry about anybody. You're good. Okay. How does that? I've been trying to think of the scripture, but a two lady get two lazy get up and get the concordance. <laughs> Gentile, yes, yeah, no, no, yes, that's Paul, that's Paul, that's Paul in Romans, yes, mm-hmm. Okay, so if there's no more male and female, why are they still constricting us to our gender roles? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you're, 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 you're phrasing it, you're phrasing it right, in fact, um, I was trying to find that scripture so I can read it to you. Um, it's Galatians. Galatians. That. Thank you. Now, therefore, there there is no longer any Jew, Gentile, male, female, bond or free. Amen. Yes. 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 That's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here it is. All right. Amen. Uh, let, let, let's look at. Uh, it's Galatians chapter 3 verses 23 
to through the end of the chapter. And then I'm going to come back to you, Carol, because I just want people to understand what you're talking about. The word says, Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Many of you, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have called yourself for Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. As if you belong to Christ, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now go ahead, Sister Carol, ask a question right quick. I mean, rephrase your, tell me your question again so that I can answer it right quick. Mm -hmm. Male or female, bond or, or free. free. Uh -huh. So on the male to female, why are we still constricted to these genders that we're in? Is this for when we get to heaven? No, the, 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 this, this is right now. As a female, we can't do this or do that or whatever. No. Still us. No, what Paul is doing here, Paul is arguing and stressing that within the body of Christ, those labels that keep us separated and keep us uh, divided in the world are not applicable inside the church, in the body of Christ, all right? Uh, you, I can't change being a man, uh, and you can't change being a woman, all right? You know, I, I'm a male, you're, you're a female. It is what it is. And he's not advocating that in all things we uh, uh, not distinguish, recognize the differences between the two. I mean, for, for example, in medicine, there's some issues in, me issues in medicine that are applicable to you that are not applicable to me and vice versa. They're applicable to me and not applicable to you. Because guess what? You, 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 you don't have a prostate, so I should never hear about you catching, uh, developing prostate cancer. I do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you, on the other hand, there are certain things that you deal with that I would never deal with. I, you should never hear me saying I have fib 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 fibrosis cysts, or whatever the name, on, 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 my, on my uterine wall. You should never hear me say that. Because I don't have a uterus. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 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 it, it's, it's so there, there are times when we need to distinguish between men and women. However, what he's saying is that when we come into this church to worship the God that we worship, it doesn't matter if you're a woman and I'm a man. We are all children of God. We're all one in God. We're all the same. We're all his people. It doesn't matter if, because you got to understand, at the time, slave owners were bringing their slaves with them to church. And so Paul is saying, when you walk through the door, I don't care what the law says out in the world, you're no longer his slave. You are, you are a slave to Christ. You are, you are his people. It doesn't matter if you were b born a Jew or born a Greek. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It's what, it's what your faith is. What you believe. And so Paul is pushing this whole understanding that your, your people uh, uh, that you worship with, that the distinction that the world looks at them and God judges them by are not applicable to uh, what how he judges us. Not applicable. Not a, remotely applicable. And so what that means, we got to stop bringing into the church the dis labels and distinctions of the world. In fact, I, I make you laugh. Um, when I left my home church to go out and let God take me wherever I was going, uh, we had deacons and deaconesses. All right, and the deaconesses were deacon deaconesses by virtue of being married to a deacon, just like we have here today at at at, at church at at, at uh, 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 first first fellowship. And this is one of the arguments I made, and I'm gonna I need to remake this argument because we were having this discussion before the coronavirus. 
if we have both feet, so let, let me, let, I'll come back to that. So I went away and I came home for something uh, and I went to church with my parents and I noticed that you had, they had there were deacons and deaconette. De there were deacons, both male and female deacons. Phil they called them Phillips and Phoebe's. All right. And I said, I said to my I said, I noticed all the deaconesses are not sitting together anymore. She said, because we're not deaconesses anymore. I said, why? Because Pastor Jones has changed that to the fact that since men, both men and women can serve as deacons, there's no need to distinguish between the two. They're all deacons. And so he had brought in a class that had women in there. And I was very impressed with that. All right. Um, so in the conversation at our own church, my, my question was, why do we still use deaconesses when we have female deacons? I mean, technically, the, the, the appropriate term for a female deacon is a deaconess. All right. If we're going to recognize, again, these labels. But why are we have and, and then have deaconesses? We have female deacons. We don't really need deaconesses anymore because we have the female deacons. Um, and so I, I, I say that to say that God is stressing, especially through Paul, but God is stressing for us this whole idea that when we come into the house of the Lord, when we worship as the body of Christ, we worship as one people, not as a group of men and a group of women, or a group of Americans, a group of group of something else. Uh, we 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 worship uh, uh, as as uh, as as one group of people. Um, amen. In fact, uh, uh, one of my colleagues just called and it disconnected the the phone. Can y'all still hear me over there? Okay, praise God. Okay, praise God. Oh, all right, there you go. Okay, good deal. Whew, Lord, uh, I, I got a call and it, it, it disconnected part of the phone. So, all right, we got it back all connected. Amen. So, I, that, that's a much shorter answer than the other questions to the to that question you asked. They're, 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 we're bringing in distinctions in the world that God has commanded us to no longer bring in. And what we have to do is stop allowing those distinctions to come in and to separate us. Because that's all they're doing. That's all they're doing. They're separating us. And the only one, the only one that has the right to do any separation is Jesus. And the only separation he's going to do is to separate the sheep from the goats. That's it. That's the only separation. The good from the evil. The, 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 the wheat from the tear. In other words, he sent these symbolisms of good, those good faithful servants versus those wicked evils, uh, wicked evil people. So, that, that's the only separation that, that is in the word. Amen. Shabbat Abedun. Amen. Praise God. Are there any other questions I can answer? Carol, if you got some more, ask them. Don't sit on them. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Right. I, I, th I think the, 
I think the Lord had his hand over that and in the cases where the, the not guilties came down. I, I don't think he had his hand on one and not the other. And I think... Okay, wait, I don't understand. Say that again. Okay, amen. So I said it again. S Sister Carol asked, did, do I think that the Lord's hand was in yesterday's verdict uh, in the Derek Chauvin trial? Yes, I think his hand was in yesterday's verdict. I also think it was in uh, those cases, like, like the Breonna Teller case, who came out with a not guilty. I think his hand was there, too. And let me tell you why I think his hand was there, too. I think what he was trying to do was to make it obvious of the, uh, make, a, make it obvious of the discrimination, the hatred, the malice, and the intention, ten, intentionality of how we mistreat one another. I do not think it is accident that even though the Attorney General in Kentucky looked on the outside like you and I look, but on the inside agreed more with Mitch McConnell and white police officers than he did with us. In fact, the Breonna Teller case didn't even go to a jury. He didn't. He didn't think there was enough uh, evidence to, to to charge charge the the the, the officer. So he, I'm sorry, I misspoke. He didn't. They, they didn't even go to jury. And here's the thing: in spite of every legal expert throughout this nation calling serious attention to the conduct and practices of those police. Those Louisville police, in spite, in spite of many uh, uh, former prosecutors, amen, not just defense, but former prosecutors, saying there's at least enough to file criminal charges. Whether it's, not, uh, whether it's enough to get a uh, conviction is a different story, but there's enough to file charges. And he, he, he pulled that trigger and, and refused to charge them because he was serving a political purpose. All right, but I believe God allowed that to happen because the intention was to get us so mad, so upset that when it came time to vote, because him and certain other people hold their offices because of the vote. All right. So what we saw was in Kentucky later that later last year, because that happened about this time uh, last year. Okay. But when it came November, persons that feigned outrage, and I'm not talking about black folks, because black folks in Kentucky voted as expected. Majority of us, I think it was 93% of us in Kentucky voted for uh, the Democratic ticket. All right? So we voted as we were supposed to. But all those white persons that lived in Kentucky that feigned it feigned anger feigned disappointment feigned uh, shock they did not learn the lesson they did not get the point they still went in to that booth and they still pulled the lever for a ticket that was going to continue to treat black people and the lives of black people in this way. Yes, went in there. I think God was trying to get us to realize that we are ki not only killing each other, but how we are discriminating, hating, and mistreating one another, and we didn't get it. And so I think that God has stepped it up because this ain't the first guilty verdict that we've seen. Uh, amen. Uh, we we saw, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the woman that, uh, the female police officer that killed Aubrey Jones because uh, she was in the wrong apartment. I, I think she got convicted of a lesser. We were upset that it was a lesser. But again, that was designed, done, pr presumably, to make us realize that we cannot continue to mistreat uh, the people of God, and there be no consequences or repercussions. And I and here's the thing: in spite of yesterday's verdict, you still have white persons 
who have been spewing since yesterday. They've been on Fox. They've been on this other new news station. Even some on 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 CNN spewing that. Uh, this is not a, a case of police brutality. This is a case of, of of resisting arrest. And what are police all supposed to do when, when suspects resist arrest? That's not what this is. And guess what? They still ain't earned it. And so, guess what? Some, something else is going to happen. And the, the consequences are going to keep getting ratcheted further up and up and up until we come to the point where we say, you know what? God, we get it. We need to come sit down at the table and work this thing out to be the people. We're not being the people who God has called us. And so here's the thing. He is going to continue to subject us to these issues, these kind of issues until we, or these kind of experiences, till we learn how to treat one another as we're supposed to treat them. Amen. But, but, he, but the, the answer to your question is his hand is in all of it. There's nothing that happens his hand is not in. Guess what? People, people, are, people are going to be mad at me. His hand was in the assassination of Martin Luther King. You want to know why? Because no one else was stepping up. No one else was stepping up. And so what he did, he said, okay, if what you're going to do is sit here and rely on just this one person, let me remove him so that other people have to step up. And, 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 and I, I think he does that a lot. I don't think he necessarily wanted to see Martin Luther King die, but he didn't stop it because guess what? The only one that was... Because uh, again, when, he, when Martin Luther King was, was assassinated, he was beyond simply, uh, we shall all get along. He was beyond simply uh, us all having the right to drink from the same fountain and attend the same schools. He was beyond that. When he was assassinated... In fact, Bishop Barber's Poor People Campaign is really nothing new. He's borrowing uh, poor people's, uh, uh, what, in fact, Martin Luther King had a poor people's campaign. He's just picking it up and going forward with it. Where the whole issue is true discrimination will not occur until we uh, uh, even out the economic disparities between the races. That, you, that guess what, we can go to the same school all you want to, you can give us the right to go to the same school all you want to, but if we can't pay for it, what's the, what's, what's the use? Ain't nothing changed. And so, no no one, at, when, when King was assassinated, he was on the outs with, with a lot of black leaders. Because they were unwilling to go that far, because they were so afraid that if they push against the economics, companies that employed their parishioners would lay them off and if they got laid off then these folks could not pay tithes and if they could not pay tithes these leaders could not drive the Cadillacs that they were driving at the time the Cadillacs and Buicks because those were the 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 and Lincolns those were the luxury cars of the time yeah. old school, that's what we are, but go on. oh yeah hey, 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 man my mama old school too she love a Cadillac she's had she's had several of them uh and, and she's had several Lincolns uh, amen. So, and, and I get it. I get it. But here's a here's a point. Uh, what leaders have to realize at some point, being a leader requires us to take a stand. Yeah. Even if taking a stand puts us at odds with other people. And here and as, and here's the thing. As a result, yeah, they silence uh, uh, Martin Luther King. Luther King. But what they really did, they ensured that for 50, 50 more years, there would be such economic disparity between the races that guess what? For all intents and purposes, much of segregation still exists. Think about it. In the neighborhoods we live in, you live in a nice neighborhood, I live in a nice neighborhood. There's so few of us that statistically we don't even register in the neighborhood. I know where you live. You live in the same neighborhood as Nicole's former uh, uh, boss. And guess and guess what? There's so few of you over there that statistically you don't even register. It's not, it's not enough for it's not enough for not enough of us in your neighborhood 
for anyone to make the statistical argument that this is a racially inclusive neighborhood. It's not. Same thing here. It's not enough of us in my neighborhood for us to make the argument that I live in a racially inclusive neighborhood. I literally live in a segregated neighborhood. And here's the thing. We don't like to say that because we don't we want to believe that the time of racial discrimination and segregation is beyond us. But it's not. I mean, we, we, we go to, we go, my, my daughter attends a school where the, where the black folks don't make up 10% of the student body. How can you, how can you tell me that's a racially inclusive school when we make up 37% of the, of the, of the, the greater Charlotte metropolitan area? We don't even, we don't even have enough numbers in relation to our overall population. We're not. And what happens when we start talking like this, we scare white people. This is called what it is. We scare white people. We scare, and they get scared to stand with us because they're, again, they are afraid of losing their economic professional connections. And so what happens when they start losing connections, they it trickles down. We start losing connections. And some most leaders don't want to to stand on this soapbox because there, there's a fear that if these connect, if, if we start losing those connections, then they lose their, their income. I don't I don't know I don't know when we became as timid and as scared as we are. I I just don't know when that happened. But 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 it, but it, th but this one goes back to what I was saying earlier about being bold enough to stand for what is right for what God is calling us to stand for. If we if we're not going to do that, then why are we here? Why are we why are we a, a gathering? Why are we associating with one another? If, we, if we're going to let all kind of harm, hurt, and foolishness exist, why are we doing anything? You got to realize Jesus was radical. Maybe maybe not as radical as what we think radical what radicalism looks like today, but you got to understand Jesus uh, uh, testimony uh, uh, Jesus argument that the last will be first the first will be last that was radical. That was that was disruptive for Jesus to sit here and say that allowing widows to put everything they have into the treasury that was radical. That was taking money out of the mouths and the hands of certain leaders to challenge the whole thing about do Christians, do people God pay taxes to Caesar? That was challenging the Roman government. That was threatening a, a well-established system. And what we don't realize, what we don't spend any time considering is that uh, 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 many times, quite often, uh, uh, Jesus' ministry was more radical, more in your face than people realize. And I think that if he was here now, he wouldn't recognize many of our churches. He would he would say you're not you're not a not a church of worshiping God, because many of our churches are too busy. Helping people get along to go along, the go. You know, no, I'm sorry to go along so that we can get along. And here, and here's the thing: Jesus was as, was as much about economics as G, as Martin Luther King was. Don't get it twisted. He was much about economics. He didn't understand why poor people were were suffering the way they were when other people were were getting wealthy off of that. Now, I'm not saying that we should go start preaching prosperity gospel messages. No, no, I'm, no, I don't believe in prosperity gospel. But what I do believe in is, is addressing this incredible imbalance in the economic welfare of the of people based upon something, nothing other than their race. And this is why I say we've got to be very careful because what's happened is persons that stand to lose everything have realized 
that it's better to let a few in to get some of what they have than to keep it all and then be forced to give it all up. Okay? Uh, uh, this is why uh, uh, some businesses, they can point to their one black employee. I remember I was in law school interviewing uh, with uh, a firm, and they had one uh, black associate, black partner, the only black per person in the whole firm. So several of us were trying to reach out to him, trying to get to connect with him. He wouldn't want to connect with us. And then we were someplace, and he was speaking, and he made a comment, why do I need to connect with anyone? I'm here. In fact, he felt threatened by the addition of more black people. In fact, he should have felt isolated. But he was so happy to be the one person getting the crumbs, getting the notoriety, being the one black person in this firm, that he, he was not willing to help anyone, any other black person come into that firm. And what happens, those who should be dispersing or dealing with this economic disparity don't have to deal with it because then they can say, hey, we've got a black person working with us. We pay him well. If he's here, why can't you be here? Knowing good and doggone well that he's a token. That that, that he that he's there to 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 as a shield to push scrutiny off of that firm and off of his practices. Knowing that the reason why other people aren't that look like him aren't here because you've been intentionally refusing to hire other people that look like him. Okay. That ain't godly. That ain't godly at all. At all. And just as some of us gonna go to hell for the lies we tell and the and the and the and the lies we we kill, some of us are gonna go to hell for the uh, disparity we 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 promulgate. It just is what it is. Amen. Amen. Well, check it out, guys. We're coming up close on the 115 uh, uh, hour. I would keep going, but I need to stop because I have to go up to my daughter's high school for a presentation uh, this afternoon. Amen. So what we'll, so, so what we'll do, we'll pause right here. We'll trust and believe that when we come together next week for Bible study, God will bless us and take us further into understanding. Uh, again, thank you for attending Bible study and thank you for your questions because I believe that these questions are allowing us to see how God operates and see his presence amongst and in, in, in our midst uh, 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 as we are going through the, the different aspects, living out the different aspects of Christian discipleship. Amen. Are there any prayer requests that we want to get up before we close out today? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's already on, on the prayer list. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much. Amen. Amen. If there are no more, then we'll go ahead and, uh, and um, have our closing word of prayer. Here, let's go to God. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we thank you for this day. For this is the day, God, that we are glad and we are worshiping in. Father God, we bless your name for all the wonderful things that you have done, for how, God, you've watched over us and guided us and literally brought us to where we are. Thank you, God, for today's Bible study session because, God, the questions asked, Gave us, gave us a chance to see how you're working in our midst. It also gave us a chance to talk about what it is that your will, what it is about your will that you reveal to us within your word. And God, we pray that as we go out and leave this Bible study, we go out into the world, that God, you allow us to take uh, your love, your grace, and your mercy out there with us so that someone who needs to experience it in the fullness thereof will do just that. That someone will experience your love, experience your grace and mercy, experience you, God. And that, God, they will come to you and become your newest servant, your newest believer, your newest child. Now, God, as we bring our Bible study to a close, we pray, God, that you would uh, 
always be with us, always go with us, always protect us and keep us so that, God, we're able to worship you in spirit and truth when we come, uh, return with one another again. Already be in our Sunday, blessing our worship service so that someone may be fed, someone may get the answers they need, and someone may be connected to you through the free pardons of their sins. Father God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, Brother Sean and Brother Amen. Carol. I mean, Brother Sister Carol. Amen. We will. We look forward to worship. Say, say what? I this drive carefully, sir. We will. We will. Amen. Yeah, I, I got to be there to preach to, to you on Sunday. Amen. The Lord willing and the creek don't rise. I ain't trying to. Get, right. a, 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 amen. I'm, I'm not trying to give you a reason why you don't get no word on Sunday. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> okay, no problem. You, you, you two do the same, all right? Okay, you know, okay. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.